So today we're going to take a look at an interesting paper titled Viral Visualizations, How Coronavirus Skeptics Use Orthodox Data Practices to Promote Unorthodox Science Online. Uh, then this paper was published in January 2021 by a team of MIT researchers. This is part of a series of paper summaries performed in Georgia Tech's CS7450 Information Visualization course taught by Professor John Stasko. So let's begin by taking a look at some COVID visualizations. If I were scrolling through social media and saw these visualizations, I'd think to myself that they look clean and professional without giving it any close inspection. And they are. These visualizations certainly look like they could belong to any major news media outlet or even a government resource. More importantly, these visualizations are accurate to the data behind them. Yet, as we can clearly see, these visualizations are made in support of unorthodox messages regarding the COVID pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, was a crazy time for the world of data visualizations. It seemed like everywhere you looked, there was a new visualization. Health officials were churning out visualizations to support their local mandates. But with official visualizations, there also came a wave of so-called counter-visualizations, and these were made to challenge the mainstream rhetoric regarding the COVID pandemic. These were often born out of a frustration over perceived infringement of personal liberties by government officials, alongside a belief that the public were being misled and that more accurate data visualizations were necessary to reflect what was truly going on. And these kind of visualizations were released in droves online, shared and reshared all over the internet, helping to drive and support anti-mask movements. This paper seeks to investigate common patterns in these counter visualizations and why they were so effective. The researchers collected data in two parts. First, there was the quantitative aspect of the data. Researchers collected over a half a million posts from Twitter containing visuals related to the pandemic, which they then narrowed down to around 41,000 posts. Image classification was used to identify different chart types used, while network analysis was used to identify what groups of individuals the graphics belong to. The second part was the qualitative aspect of the data. To figure out the discourse going on behind these graphics, the researchers performed a six-month observational study between March and September of 2020, back when COVID first broke out. They joined communities on Facebook and Twitter dedicated to making and discussing these counter visualizations, deep lurking in these communities to try to understand the motives and reasoning behind the visas. For context, some of these communities were later banned by Facebook and ended up moving to Parler and MeWe. So what kind of visualizations are Twitter users sharing about the pandemic? Well. With image classification, the researchers were able to classify all of the visualizations into different types. Eight main types were identified, uh, line charts, images, maps, tables, bar charts, dashboards, area charts, and pie charts. These were then displayed in a UMAP visualization clustered using k-means. Interestingly, the images and dashboard clusters are filled with screenshots of the Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard, along with memes and other images. More importantly, there is a good balance of a variety of chart types, and these are all common types found in the data visualization community. Well, now we ask, what are the different networks of Twitter users who share COVID-related data visualizations, and how do they interact with each other? Well, looking into who is sharing these posts, the researchers were able to develop a user network with six main groups. We have the American Pollux and Media Group, American politics and right-wing media, British news media, the anti-mass network, a New York Times-centric network, and the World Health Organization and other health organizations uh, network. Notably, the New York Times-centric network is actually largely centered around one visualization by Andy Slavitt, announcing that the New York Times had sued the CDC over a bar chart that ended up being widely shared. All right. So here we have the six groups and their individual UMAP representations of chart types. Note that the anti-mask group that we are interested in is at the bottom left, group four. So overall, each group has one viral hit, while the anti-mask group tends to have higher average levels of engagement than the other communities, with an average of 65 being the third best, uh, surpassing, uh, surpassed only by American politics in group one and British news media in group three. 
We also see that the anti-mask group has the second highest number of charts coming in at 1,799, surpassed only by the right-wing media group. They also use the most area and line charts and the least images across the six communities. Uh, as mentioned before, images in the data set are usually memes or photos of politicians. So here we see some statistics regarding the nature of the actual tweets. The anti-mask community has the second highest percentage of in-network retweets at 82.17%, indicating their ability to overwhelmingly amplify these visualizations to other users within their own network. Notably, 37.12% of the tweets in the anti-mask community are also original tweets, which is the third highest percentage. This also emphasizes the importance of original work within this community, which we will talk about next. So, what themes exist within this anti-mask community? Well, first there is a heavy emphasis on original content. The anti-mask community heavily values personal research over direct reading of expert interpretations. Outside content is generally prohibited, and the group moderators often encourage their followers to make their own graphs, which are then shared to larger audiences. To do this, there is a great deal of discussion and sharing of techniques on how to obtain government health data as well as how to build visualizations for yourself. There is also this idea of critically assessing data sources. Discussion generally involves a debate on which metrics matter, mostly arguing that deaths are more important than cases and that deaths are being wrongly attributed to COVID. There is also a frustration over data transparency, with claims that state and local governments are deliberately withholding data to prevent individuals from making their own decisions. And of course, the group also believes that the data presented itself is subjective, as it is already coded, cleaned, and aggregated by groups with nefarious intentions. This is compounded by the lack of transparency within the data collection systems. <coughs> Critically assessing data representations is also an important theme. Here, group members discuss how different types of visualizations may obscure or highlight certain information. And for some, raw data itself provides more accurate information than any data transformation. Some go so far as to present screenshots of tables as the most faithful way to represent data. As alluded to previously, group members also see bias in politics as affecting the data visualizations illustrating the pandemic. They acknowledge that they themselves are biased and argue that the people who make visualizations are biased too, claiming that groups generating data visualizations have profit-driven motives. Some reference how the tobacco industry has historically manipulated data to mislead consumers, and they draw parallels to modern-day pharmaceutical companies and vaccine makers. This one is simple. Uh, members often appeal to scientific authority, or rather ethos as we know it. Members tend to validate their own expertise by referring to their own doctoral degrees or publications in prominent science journals or even on the ground experience. The group also channels this unity mindset of helping each other develop skills in creating data visualizations and championing the idea of having open, critical discussion regarding mainstream visualizations and each other's visualizations. You can think of it as a group of individuals bonding over a book club, but in the name of data literacy. Last but not least, the group calls for action, uh, encouraging members to apply their skills to the real world to lobby local communities and politicians. The idea is that only that they, uh, the idea is that only they can help make their communities safer, and that they must hold politicians accountable with better data representations. So. Why are these counter-visualization communities so attractive and effective? Well, beyond the aforementioned ideals, it's interesting to find that these groups are using the same data to support unorthodox messages. The group is primarily driven by distrust of the political system and see their work as an act of resistance. Data literacy, data literacy for these anti-maskers represent the American ideal of intellectual self-reliance, which historically means rejecting experts and the elite. Using the same data, the group comes to completely different conclusions because of the way they perceive the data. Uh, identifying the data as fundamentally subjective, members believe that the data is itself an over-reporting of cases and deaths, at best unreliable, and no more significant than the flu. On the ground, members also draw from their own experience as evidence, with many not personally knowing anyone who had experienced COVID. This disparity between their personal experience and the statistics shown in the media drives their argument. Most importantly, group members believe that science is a process for the individual and not an institution, hence their distrust in the so-called scientific community and emphasis on original personal analysis. 
this resentment toward the scientific community is compounded by this perceived contempt with which the scientific community treats them, that the mainstream media is a conglomerate of condescending elites that expect intellectual subservience rather than critical thinking from the public. Here we see a quote from Dr. Fauci that emphasizes this idea of the elite's contempt, with Fauci stating that they don't believe in science when the group members see themselves as firm believers and champions of science. So, what can we do? Well, the researchers offer two starting points. First, visualization developers need to acknowledge the social and political dimensions of their work from the beginning, not after everything has been released. By acknowledging the political implications and influence of their work, there is a greater trust in the community. Second, more transparency is needed regarding the uncertainty inherent in the data and visualizations themselves. As we know, uncertainty is everywhere in scientific data, and researchers often believe that people will not understand and be able to interpret results that communicate uncertainty. And as a result, they end up not being entirely transparent about the uncertainty involved. How we might express uncertainty in data so as to recognize its socially and historically situated nature is a question for future scientists and visualization researchers to investigate. At the end of the day, the researchers see data analysis and visualization as a battleground over who can be considered an expert in the field. By democratizing data analysis and visualization, greater trust in the data visualization community can exist instead of the current distrust due to perceived lack of transparency and elitism. On that note, here's a final visualization mocking the elitism of mainstream orthodox visualizations of COVID.